And let's just go into another season of prayer just for a moment before we even get into the sermon and um, just intercede on behalf of some, some of these special needs. So, Father, we do come into your presence, and we thank you that you are indeed God and that you care about literally every aspect of our lives. Whether it's, we're talking about a corporate worship setting like this, you actually care about our worship, and you care about what you are wanting to, your spirit to speak to our heart. You care about those things. You care that we actually invite you into our presence and to humble ourselves before you. You care about these things. And you even care about our, our physical well-being here on this side of eternity. And Lord, there's things that we go through. We don't understand why. I mean, we know, we know that the result is because of, of what happened in the garden. We know that sin entered into this world. And as a result, that that's where disease and sickness and pains and hurts and sorrows, that it all was a result of the fall of the garden. But yet, Father, how it happens because of your sovereign nature, how you allow one to go and walk this journey of, of diabetes and allow another not to, Father, I don't understand how those parts work. But what I know is that in each and every one of those cases that your hand is sovereign, your grace is sufficient. And so, Father, even right now, I want to pray for, for Cohen and Kim and Ian as they just, as parents, figure out, you know, what does that mean for their next step? Father, I pray that you give them wisdom and discernment and good counsel from people like Cindy and others. And Father, that you would be glorified in the midst, that you turn this into a thing of praise. Um, Father, I know that Adeline, even this week, was uh, receiving some results back from, from her test that she had. And I want to pray for her even right now, that you would touch her body. And uh, Father, I, I, I haven't heard the results. But Father, I, I pray that indeed that it is, it is nothing uh, severe that it is just just one of those things, it's, it's, it's benign and there's nothing there. And we just pray for her and ask for your grace to be upon her. Father, even right now, even just, just thinking about just the COVID stuff that's going on, Father, there's several churches within our county that have been directly affected because of COVID. Um, Harold has still been battling through his there at Emmanuel. And so, Father, as a result, they're still not meeting, and we just pray that you would work with Harold in his heart and in his life and his and his physical well-being, that you restore him to fullness and health. By the way, I know the same thing is true with the Canary family at uh, First Christian, that they've been battling through this as well, and they're still not back uh, to, the, to the church themselves. Others have taken up the, the slack there, but but they themselves are battling through it. And then, Father, then, then another area is, is just in the grief and the loss of loved ones. Um, Obviously, Pastor Jim at Oak Grove lost his mother over the weekend. And so, Father, we just pray that, that you would be with Jim and the rest of his family as they grieve this time of loss. Granted, it's, it's, it's the death of a godly one. And so in that, we rejoice. But yet, Father, there's still the earthly pains and the things that we struggle through. And so, Father, we raise Oak Grove up to you as they walk this portion of their journey out. Father, there's, there's so many others. One of the things that we absolutely know is that Satan does not want the church of any church, whether it be First Bowling Green, whether it be another church, he does not want churches to be unified. He does not want churches to be of a singular focus to your glory. And Father, I'm even thinking about some conversations with another pastor I even had this week and just the struggles that's going on within the life of him and his church even right now. And Father, I, that one I'm not at liberty for public purposes to pray the names, but Father, you know exactly who that church is and that family is right here in our county. And so, Father, I pray that you would show mercy and show grace. Heal that which is broken. Bring about glory to your name as you touch these things. And then, Father, even like within life of our church, Father, we've got revival next week. Revival is coming. And so, Father, right now, you've been doing a really sweet thing within our life of our church, and we say thank you. We say thank you for what you've been doing in our life. But, Father, we don't want it to stop. We, we really we want to grow in our relationship with you, that, that our love might abound more and more in, in, in real knowledge and all discernment, that it might just grow, and we might go from glory to glory to glory. Growing in our intimacy with you, growing in our 
unity within the body of Christ, growing within our evangelistic zeal, growing within our desire to exalt you and to praise you and to adore you. And so, Father, I pray right now that we, as a body of believers, would be just compelled to go and invite people to come back to our revival services, especially if they do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we, we would invite them to come back and to be a part of these services with Phil Wade, even next week. Father, be with Phil and first impression, let your Holy Spirit truly be upon them. Prepare their hearts even now this week, and even every night this week as we gather to pray, Father, I pray that you would draw on our hearts and that you would give us the words by your Holy Spirit's prompting, the words to say for, for intercession and for prayer. Father, even today, in terms of like our prayer sheet, our pre revival prayer time, it, it's telling us to be praying for our deacons here at First Baptist Bowling Green. So Father, I want to pray for our deacons right now. I pray that you would give them truly a, a, a heartbeat for their families that are upon their list. And that they would continually, even through all of this, this time period of what's been going on with COVID and, and even beyond, I probably pray, Father, that you would burden them to reach out to those within the, their family structures and to do in-reach as well as to do outreach, but to, to love on those that you have put in their charge as their deacon families. Father, burden them for the wholeness and the unity of the body of Christ. So, Father, bless our deacons indeed as they walk in obedience with you. Father, even as a church, we, we've got, we're making decisions, and Father, we've, we've a, authorized a search committee to be out there looking to find a next associate pastor for our church and the life of our church. And Father, I just want to pray for that entire search committee. And I want to pray for um, all the candidates they're talking with. Father, you know exactly who the individual it is that you are desiring to come here to do work within our youth and our student ministries and, and to help just knit families together and to, to help strengthen us in terms of ministry. So, Father, we're asking for that ministry match, and we're asking that you would give us wisdom and discernment and grace to know who it is we ought to be drawing and, and asking to come to fill this position. Father, let us walk this journey out with you. And so, Father, I know that the team, the search team, has been doing this for a very long time. And I know at times that we can get weary in doing good. So, Father, I pray that you give them strength, and I pray that you give them wisdom. I pray that you give them a supernatural understanding of what is, what is really going on and to say, yes, Lord. Father, I know we've kind of narrowed it down to a specific candidate at this moment. And, Father, if this is the right one, Father, give us an absolute yes. Lord, yes. And Lord, if it's not the right one, then give us that, that peace that says, no, this isn't the one, this isn't the right time. But Father, you're the only one that really knows. And that's part of the, that's part of the challenge of walking this out is to discern your will. And so, Father, I pray that you give us that discernment and that you make us unified and clarified and just all to your glory. Father, I thank you for the sweet spirit of that search committee. I thank you for the way that they have come together week in, and, well, not week in and week out, but, but meeting in and meeting out and have prayed and have sought your counsel, have challenged on each other and, and said, let's, let's do this the right way. Father, thank you for that. Thank you for Jason's leadership over that search committee. Thank you for all the time that he's invested in making some phone calls and doing some ad work and things. Father, thank you for all that's been going on with in regards to that. But we lay it before you and lift this situation up, asking for your grace and glory to be, be felt among us. Father, now that we turn our attention back to your word, I just felt this need to do that this morning, just to intercede on some of these, these very real needs that are going on within the life of our church and within the life of our community. So, Father, now as we turn our attention back to your word, Father, I pray that you would let our hearts be receptive to what you would have to us to learn about how to handle money your way, and that you would be glorified as a result. Father, we love you indeed, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So we have been in a sermon series on how, learning how to handle money God's way. And last week was really the first week where we actually started to actually, if you will, start looking actually at money itself. Last week was the first week. So we've been in this, this entire series, and we've been talking about honesty. We've been talking about friendship. 
We've been talking about godly counsel. We've been talking about all these things that are prerequisites to understanding how we handle money. And last week we learned that when you need money, go to work, right? That's that when you want, you're not going to, you're not going to get it. Well, some people are not going to go there, but that's not what the sermon's about. We're going to stay with savings. We're going to stay with savings. But when you need money, go to work, get a job. Okay. All right. That's what you need to do. Or go start a job, go be an entrepreneur, do something, but go earn your money. You earn money. All right. Well, now this week, we're going to look at this next part, which deals with savings. And Crown Financial actually wrote these words. Crown Financial put this in their book. They said, the secret to financial success, this is brilliant, okay? This, uh, you, you're going to want to write this down. You're going to want to write this down, okay? So grab your, grab your sheets of paper out here. This is brilliant, okay? You've never heard anything like this before, I promise you. <laughs> the secret to financial success is, and I quote, to spend what is left after you save. Yes, yeah, spend what is left after you save rather than save what is left after you spend. You know, another way that they say that is live on less than you make. That's another way people would say that same thing. Live on less than you make. That's a profound secret, isn't it? Sounds something like something your, your parents or your grandparents or your great-grandparents might have told you, right? It's godly wisdom is what you're being told in that simple phrase, all right? So let's look at some of the value of saving. Let's look at some of the value. So Proverbs 21.20 says these words. Proverbs 21.20 says, There is precious treasure and oil in the dwelling of the wise. But a foolish man swallows it up. So do you understand the distinction? The, the wise individual saves, and the foolish one just consumes. Okay? Let, let's, let's keep going. Let's jump to another proverb. Proverbs 30, verse 24 and 25 says this. Four things are small on the earth, but they are exceedingly wise. The ants are not a strong people, but they prepare their food in the summer. And then he goes on and gives three other illustrations. Here's what the, the point of that is. Is the ants know that when the food time is done, they had better have saved some or they're not going to have food when there is none. So they've got to save for it. So what do they do? What, and you watch it. You all have watched the movies. You all, I mean, you know, you've seen, you've, seen, you've seen ants, you know. You've watched those cartoons, especially if you've had kids. What are they doing? They're out there grabbing the leaves and bringing it on in into the, into the, into the house, you know, to the storehouse of the food for the ants and stuff. That's what they're doing. Why are they doing all that? Because of the fact that they need to be prepared when there's not actually food. So that's what they do. And, and Proverbs is basically saying, you need to be wise like that. Store up for the rainy day. Okay? Joseph, Joseph understood this, did he not? In the scriptures? Remember, he gets the, 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 the Pharaoh gets the dream, and he says, well, here's what you need to do. For the, for, you're going to have seven years of a bumper crop, seven years of fantastic yielding of the stuff. So what you got to do is during those seven years, build up barns and save up the grains. And then when the seven years of famine come, you just distribute it out slowly, evenly, methodically, and at the end result, you'll own all of Egypt, Pharaoh king. That's not really the focus of that point. The focus that I'm really trying to get you to is you save. Save for the rainy day, okay? This is another, this is a big quote from, from Crown Financial. The biggest reason people don't save is that they are impatient. The biggest reason people do not save is they are impatient. When they see something they want to buy, they want it now. And we are such a microwave generation that that really is. We have lost the ability to delay gratification. It's simple. The day of the layaway plan was a good thing. You didn't have the money, so every week you put a little money down there at the layaway. I said, I'm curious, any of you kids even ever heard of a layaway plan? I, you ever heard of one? You've never heard of one? No, she hasn't. Don't even act like she has. 
Your kid doesn't know what a layaway plan is. I haven't even heard of one. You used to go down to the store and you would take an item and you'd buy like a bicycle and you'd take it and they'd lay away. They'd lay the bicycle in the back. And then every week you'd go in and you'd pay money. And then when you'd finally made the final payment, they'd give you that bicycle. But you know what we do now? Yeah, I'm talking to you. Do you know what we do now? We just go get a credit card and we go, oh, let me buy it now. And then we pay interest on it at 21%. And we go, Woohoo, look at me, I got a bicycle that I'm going to pay off for the next two years. Exactly. That is exactly right. Y'all better listen. That boy, he's wise. Okay? All right. So while you are young, it is the best time to discover and understand the value of saving money. And in fact, you'll remember, even if you were listening to any of my thoughts by Scott Vlogs this week, I encourage you, young people, you needed to be here in this message. So really, I'm really preaching to you too, okay? I'm preaching, yeah. In fact, considering you're right there, I'm going to preach to you. Shannon, why don't you just slide up there and sit in that row too, because you're a young person too. I'll look back to you two every now and then, okay? All right? But young people, y'all, this is message is really for you, all right? Because some of these older folks, I'm sorry, it's too late. So, so no, it's, it's not. It's never, it's never too late. D- Dave Ramsey says it's never too late. It's never too late, all right? Now, understand, Dave Ramsey, he's, he recommends that you actually save or slice save and then invest 15% of your income. That's what he recommends. Some of you are sitting there going, 15%? Yes, 15%. That's his recommendation, and I would agree with that. So what are, what are the things that we're supposed to be saving for? There's three predominant things we need to save for, and these are, here, here, here's what they are. The first thing we need to save for is for emergencies. We need to save for emergencies. You never know when the car is going to finally break. So you need to have a replacement fund for the car, okay? You never know when something's going to break, and so you need things, you know, you don't know when the AC is going to break. You don't know when the roof's going to leak. You know, you don't know when the water heater is going to, need to be replaced, all these kind of things. So you save. The second thing that you save for is actually for, and this goes back to, this goes back to the layaway thing. Hey, I'm talking to you two again. It's back to the layaway thing. You save for future spending. So guess what? Okay, this is going to surprise you. Oh my goodness, this is going to surprise you. Did you all know, did you all know that Christmas is going to come on the 25th of December this year? Yeah. <laughs> I... I know. It surprised me, too. It surprised me, too. I had no idea that Christmas was coming on the 25th of December. It, it was, when I saw it on the calendar this year, I almost fell out. I went, no, no, not this year. So what do you do is you save for Christmas. But you know what the vast majority of Americans do? Credit card. <laughs> Pay through it through December, January, February, March, and they're still paying for what they did back in December. Save for it. Save for it. Save for future spending. And then, the, then the next one that you save for is literally it's long-term savings. Long-term savings. This is for retirement because the government is not supposed to be your retirement plan. It never was supposed to be your plan. It never was supposed to be the plan. Ever. Okay, so you save for retirement. So this would be your second major point. It is that of investing. It's really not a mystery. It's not a mystery. Investing is not. It's really not that hard. Okay, so, so here, here, here's some of the truth to it. The first one is this. Investing is all about steady plotting. Steady plotting. That's the key to investing. Here's what Proverbs 21.5 says. Proverbs 21.5 says this. It says, the plans of the diligent lead surely to advantage, but everyone who is hasty comes surely to poverty. Did you understand what's going on here? He's saying the plans. What is the plan? The plan is to steadily invest. It's just methodical, 15%. 15%, 15%, 15%. By the way, that 15%, this is another Dave Ramsey thing, that comes out after you're out of debt. Until you're out of debt, just throw everything into the debt. Get rid of the debt, get rid of the debt. Then once you're out of the debt, then you start to focus in on the investing side of things after you have your emergency fund built up, all right? 
So then you have this diligent plan, just surely, 15%, 15%. And what does it lead to? It leads to your advantage. In other words, you will have your rainy day fund and you will be able to enjoy retirement. Okay? But if you're hasty, what does it lead to? Poverty. That original word here, that original Hebrew word here for diligent, it literally translates into steady plotting, which is why I gave you that point. And it literally, it creates this image. It's of a person filling a large barrel with sand one handful at a time. That's the actual imagery. That's that word, that Hebrew word there. It's just grabbing a thing of sand and pouring it into this big barrel. How's it, how, it's going to take a while. It's going to take a while. One scoop, one scoop. It's going to take a while, okay? All right, so now here. This is, this is this young people, this is why I really wanted you here. The second thing about investing that you need to understand is compound interest. That ought to have just made you get all excited. It should have, okay? Destiny, this is crucial, okay? Compound interest is where it's all at, all right? Let me give you some charts as to why I say that. There are three elements to compound interest. interest. The first element to a compound interest is actually the amount. The amount. That's right. Tell you you're back there. You all listen to this, okay? The amount. So how much you save will determine by how much income you will, you will have to spend later on, okay? So here's what we look at. The amount you keep putting in. Again, how much you put in? How much you put in after, you, after you're out of debt and you got your emergency fund? How much you put in? That's exactly right. That's the magic, that's the magic phrase. It's not Jesus today. It's 15%, okay? All right? Jesus is the one that's going to give you that 15% to put in there, but 15%, okay? Now, so that's the amount. The second thing that's important with compound interest is this, the actual interest rate. Look at this chart. Look at this chart. All right. So I want you to see here, and I'm not going to read through this entire chart. You want you can take a picture of it real quickly, young folks. But if your interest rate is at 6%, okay, and you basically put in $1,000 a year, after five years, your amount will have grown to $5,975. If for some reason you got yourself into some kind of good investment vehicle and you got 12%, that same $5,000 would now be worth $7,115. That's, that's, that's almost $1,000, $1,200 something swing almost, okay? Just by the interest rate, just by the interest rate. Then you take this thing out and you go 5, 10, 15, you get out here to 40 years later. I want you to see what happens. Every year, all you've been doing for 40 years is every year you've been putting in $1,000, $1,000, $1,000, $1,000. If your interest rate, if your vehicle is only a 6% interest rate, you will have only made $164,048. But, but if your vehicle was at 10%, you'd be making $486,851. So this interest rate thing is huge. So you want to put your investments in something that has a greater interest rate. That's the reason why Dave Ramsey recommends things called Smart Vester Pros. Okay? And I'd recommend that to you as well. So the interest rate has a major impact on what happens to your compounding of your amount that you put in. Okay, the third factor, and this chart kind of leads to it, but I want you to see it with a different chart, is that of time, that of time. Look what you have here, okay? This is, here's, what, here's specifically what you've got going on here. Let me read this to you. If you basically save $2.70 each day, that is roughly $1,000 a year, okay? And in this chart, this is at a 10% interest rate curve. At the end of 50 years, you will have saved, that's what this chart is about, at the end of 50 years, you will have saved $1,262,769. All right? Which gives you an earning at 10% of basically $10,523 a month. You think you can live off of $5,000, I mean $10,523 a month? I hope so. I hope so. Okay. So in other words, that $1,000 that you started one year cost the investor only $100,000. Or 
excuse me, excuse me, if you waited one year, if you waited one year, and you only did it 49 years, young people, this is why I'm trying to help you understand with the, the long-term thing. If you only did it 49 years instead of 50, you waited one year, it will cost you over $100,000 in interest that you would have gained. Just one year. One $1,000 year that you forgot to invest in will cost you literally $114,748. Okay? Let me show it to you another way. Let me show you to another way. Throw up the other chart. You all can't read this chart. Okay? You can't read this chart. But you can Google the chart and you can find it. Basically, here's what you see with this chart. Oh, there. Hey. Oh, you're fantastic. Wendy, you're amazing. Can you all see that now? Okay. What you have here is a person that's 21 years of age. And this 21-year-old puts in $1,000, and that's it. And they do it until they're 27 years of age. Every year, they put in $1,000 from the age of 21 to the age of 27. And then all of a sudden, they say, you know what? That preacher lied to me. I ain't going to put another dime in this thing. Okay? And, but then there was this other fella who starts at the age of 28 and says, you know what? That preacher said I should have started this seven years ago, but I'm just now getting started. And this person puts in $1,000 from the age of 28 all the way down. Let's go to the next, is it, there it is. And gives all the way till they're 65. So here's the key. This kid over here that put it in from age 21 to 27, put in $8,000. That's all they put in, $8,000. The compound interest would result in $427,736. $8,000 becomes $427,736. Pretty good investment on, on $8,000, on $8, right? Now, this other kid, this other kid who started at 28, put in money from 28 to 65, put in $37,000. That's how much that person put in, $37,000. $8,000, $37,000. 8, but because this kid started when they were little, the compound interest grew to $427,000. This person here who put it in for $37,000 for 37 straight years, you know what they end up with? $363,043. Which one would you rather have? Do you understand, young people? This is why I'm trying to help you understand this. And every single adult in here is telling you this. Just go ask them. Go ask any one of them. Start young. Compound interest is what um, Benjamin Franklin called the eighth wonder of the world. He did. Benjamin Franklin called it the eighth wonder of the world, is what he called it. Okay? Now, let me, let me hit this. We're going to run through this quickly. Now, there's, there's some things we do need to avoid, though. So we've looked at steady plotting. We've looked at compound interest. But what we also need to do is we need to avoid risky investments. There's risk in every investment. But there's a difference between a risky investment and risk. Let me read Ecclesiastes to you. Ecclesiastes 5, 13 and fit through 15 says this, there is a grievous, grievous evil which I have seen under the sun, riches being hoarded by their owner to his hurt. When those riches were lost through a bad investment, and he had fathered a son, then there was nothing to support him. As he had come naked from his mother's womb, so he will return as he came. He will take nothing from the fruit of his labor that he can carry in his hand. Here's basically the point of it. There's going to be things that you're going to hear about in your life, and it's going to sound too good to be true. It is. There's a reason it sounded too good to be true. All right? So when you have somebody trying to tell you, oh, you put this in here, you don't get 30%, 40% interest from, back from this, run like the wind. Okay? Do, do you all understand? I'm not going to tell you what those things are, but they're out there. All right? The Nigerian prince is not giving you any money. Okay? No matter what you think, he isn't going to do it. 
run from speculation. All right? Look, you're just, this is kind of a thing. Day trading, for example. They've actually done statistics on this kind of stuff. They've, they've done experiments. They actually took day traders, put them in a room, they did this stuff, and they did this experiment for a while, and then they took a monkey who literally just threw darts at an arrow board, on, on a dart board. And when it hit on the dart board, it landed on stocks. And they then did an, invest, did, did an analysis as to the ones who were actually stock picking daily and those who the monkey just threw up there. Guess what? They came out almost identical. They did. Because that's about what day trading really is. It's just pure speculation. Oh, yeah, I think that sounds great. Dartboard. <laughs> Watch that, monkey. If it sounded too good, it probably is. And you never hear of one saying, oh, I lost all my money. They only tell you about the rarity and the run occasion. Oh, but this happened. Yeah, well, people get struck by lightning, too. I don't recommend that either. Okay? Doesn't happen enough. So, other investments issues, other investment issues. If it sounds too good, if it sounds too good, it probably is. So avoid super risky investments. So now these other investment issues, okay? I know this is a hot topic for some of y'all. This next one is this, that of lotteries and gambling. Lotteries and gambling. A study discovered that people spend 15 times more money on gambling than they donate to the church. That'll bless your heart. Now listen to this. This is crucial. The Bible does not specifically prohibit gambling. I know that's just surprised some of y'all, but the Bible does not specifically prohibit gambling. However, many who gamble do so in an attempt to get rich quick, which we just now talked about, avoid risky investments. Gambling is not an investment. It is literally a quick get rich quick scheme, okay? So this motivation of trying to get rich quick is the violation of what the scripture teaches. So we ought not to expose ourselves to the risk of becoming compulsive gamblers, nor should we support an industry that enslaves so many. And that is what really ends up happening. There are those who have compulsive personalities. And there's because of that compulsive personality, it actually becomes something that enslaves them. That is what we should try to be avoiding, okay? One way to put it, one way I've heard it put, is that what gambling is, is a self-imposed tax on the poor. Self-imposed tax on the poor. That is what I've heard. So another investment issue, and this is going to be the last one of the investment issues, and then I'm going to hit something really hard. And that is this, wills. W-I-L-L-S, wills. Second Kings 20 verse 1 said this, 2 Kings 20, verse 1 says, In those days, Hezekiah became mortally ill. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Let me tell you, another study was done. Guess what? So far, there has been, up to this point in human history, up to this point, there has been a 100% mortality rate. Let that one sink in for you. Yeah. yeah. You're going to die unless the rapture comes and takes you home. You understand? And even if the rapture comes and takes you home, you still could have gotten your house in order for those that might have been left behind. All right? Here's the point. Here's the point. You do need to get your life in order. And more often than not, when somebody dies and they don't have a will in place, it creates extra stress on the family afterwards. That's what you do not want to do. You do not want to create extra stress on the family after you. So as long as soon as you as soon as you are of age where you have somebody that is dependent upon you, you need to create a will. Every person who needs to create a will so that there's no complications as to what your wishes were. And they're not that expensive. But don't leave the burden to your family. All right? Now, I got about three or four minutes that I want to nail this last part. I do want to tell you about one investment. I want to tell you about one investment that really does have a 100% guarantee. Yes, I did say that. There is one investment 
that has a 100% guarantee. I want to talk about that for the next few moments. Here it is. If you're taking notes, God loves you and wants you to know him. God loves you and wants you to know him. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God loves you and says he wants you to have everlasting life. This is his heartbeat. This is his desire. And he, God, never breaks one of his promises. Ever. So if he says, if you enter into a relationship with me, you have an everlasting life, you have a 100% guarantee that you will have everlasting life in Christ Jesus. Letter B, however, is that unfortunately, we are separated from God. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every single one of us have sinned. Every one of us. And because we have sinned, if we do not enter into this investment, we will spend eternity in the lake of fire separated from the love of God. Every one of us who do not know Christ Jesus will spend eternity in torment and suffering away from God's love. And here's, again, we did this on, we've done this on other occasions. We did this back in January. You can deny truth all you want, but it doesn't mean that the truth isn't true. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. He is the truth. What he says about it is truth. You may not like it, but it doesn't change the reality. In fact, I just now said that, John 14, 6 verse, but here's the issue. God's only provision for this gap, this sin problem, is Jesus. He just said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. Romans 5, 8 says it this way, but God demonstrated his own love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So God sat there and said, I know you can't come to me, so I will come to you and I will make a way for you. I'll make a provision for you. Which this then leads into this relationship is a gift. It is a gift from God. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own. It is the gift of God so that no one can boast. It's not a result of work so that no one can boast. This is what it is. It is a gift. It's the gift of God. It's not based on your works. So in other words, each one of us must receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. In other words, my faith can't save you. Your parents' faith can't save you. Your grandparents' faith can't save you. It is a faith decision that each and every one of us have to make. Every one of us. And I'm telling you, it is a 100% guaranteed investment. If you are sincere, if you are genuine, if you really do come before him and say, Lord God, I am a sinner, please forgive me of my sins and enter into my life, Jesus says, I will. I will. And as soon as that happens, you are no longer your own. You were bought with a price, and you are a new creation. And he says, from here on out, I will dwell with you and you with me, and we will have fellowship together. It's a promise, and it is 100% true. What have you done with Jesus? Because it's more important. Talking about saving, that saving more important than anything else we've talked about in this earthly regard. Yeah, the Bible's telling us a whole lot of stuff about savings. It's called us wise if we save. But only one of these savings really matters in eternity. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your grace and for your mercy. I thank you for the wisdom that you give to us. I thank you that we do not have to worry and wonder about our eternity. We can actually have the certainty of knowing that we are born again is what the scripture says it. We can know without a shadow of a doubt that we are truly yours. In fact, the John in his first, first epistle letter said, 
I have written these things that you may know you have eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Father, we can know for certainty that we have the greatest investment of all time, a relationship with you. And Father, I pray that if there's anyone here in this room that does not know you, that the scripture says that today is the day of salvation. And I pray that today would be the day that they would make a decision and say, yes, I need Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Father, draw in their heart. And Father, if they already are yours, but for some reason right now, they've just been in a season where they're not really hearing from you. Father, may this be the day where they come and they lay their sins before you at these steps that we call altars and just confess to you and say, God, my relationship with you isn't where it needs to be. Restore back to me the joy of my salvation. Father, let them come to these altars. Again, you tell us in your scriptures that you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All we have to do is cry out to you and say, Father, forgive me. For the saved, for the lost, you've eternally secured us if we are in Christ Jesus. Father, thank you for your goodness and your grace. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.